Thank you all so much for being here today. I'm Katrina Fenlon. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Maryland College of Information Studies. My background is in library and information science. And I want to talk to you today about a research study that I and my colleagues have been conducting on what we're calling community-centered sustainability. So this talk is mainly conceptual. This is sort of reflecting on what we've learned from this research about approaches to sustainability for DH projects that really put communities of different kinds at the center of what sustainability means and how it's implemented. And we just hope it's useful in helping you and, um, and other sort of stakeholders in this ecosystem think more holistically about um, what it means to help projects endure. So we're talking today about projects that are community-centered, that are developed and maintained by communities of different kinds. Um, local communities, communities of identity, communities of practice, sort of research groups. Um, and so for a couple of years, um, we've been working closely with four projects, um, conducting interviews with their members, attending and participating in their project meetings and workshops, um, and sort of gathering insights on how they think about sustainability, um, how they define it within their own context, and, and how they're going about ensuring sustainability for their projects. And what we've learned from this study is that the meaning of sustainability for these community-based projects is um, often at odds with how we talk about sustainability and preservation in institutional contexts, and particularly within preservation-oriented institutions. So there's a disconnect between what community-centered sustainability means and what it entails, and what we within DH centers and libraries and other institutions that maintain digital scholarship um, talk about when we talk about sustainability. So first, let me introduce the four case studies, and then I'll talk about some of the um, core concepts in this work, some definitions, and then uh, briefly walk through a framework of factors we've identified and how communities are thinking about this. So these four projects may seem very different from each other on the face. Um, some of them may be familiar to you. Maybe you've been involved in them. Um, and if so, I'd love to hear from you if I haven't talked to you before. Um, but the first, enslaved.org, this is a large open source linked data hub um, of data about enslaved people. It was built on data sets that were contributed by historians um, and by other digital humanities projects. And it now accepts submissions from cultural heritage institutions and people with their family, um, family history records. So these are usually data sets that have been derived, often manually, from um, archival records or family um, records. And it currently has, I think, um, more than 600,000 records of people, more than 5 million data points in total. The second project, the Lakeland Digital Archive, this is a local digital community archive of a historically African-American community in College Park, Maryland, which is where the university is located. Um, and Lakeland is a community that thrived for decades before the process of urban renewal sort of destroyed and displaced much of the community. So for the past decade, this community has been working on documenting their own story, documenting the contributions they've made to regional history, um, and partnering with the University of Maryland, the Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities to build a digital archive, um, which has become a sort of foundation for a restorative justice initiative for this community. And um, that has actually been taken up officially by the city, and they're working on exploring reparations for the community based on the harms done in urban renewal that are documented in the archive. The third project, the Music Encoding Initiative, this is an effort to define standards for encoding musical documents into machine-readable structures. You've probably heard of it because it's a very long-running initiative. Um, it's been sustained for decades at this point. Um, and it has a governance structure. It has um, an elected board and a technical team that oversees its maintenance. And then it has a sort of wider community that attends conferences and deploys the standard in different ways and uh, conducts training workshops and that kind of thing. And the fourth project is the Open Islamic at Text Initiative um, and the closely related QTAB project. So this is a cross-institutional endeavor to create a machine-actionable corpus of texts um, from the Islamic at world pre-modern texts um, in Arabic, New Persian, Ottoman Turkish, and, uh, and these 
two projects form this sort of cluster of interrelated research strands that involve an overlapping set of collaborators. Okay, so we have these four very different projects. We have a digital community archive. We have this effort to define a standard. We have this effort to build infrastructure for text analysis. And we have a linked data hub. Um, they're really divergent in terms of their topical focus, how their teams are shaped, how they've been funded, how long they've been running, and more. And yet, we, um, we might understand all of these projects as being community-based knowledge infrastructures. So this is a term we use, this idea of a knowledge infrastructure, infrastructure as something a community builds and maintains to gather and represent and provide access to and ultimately to preserve and maintain um, knowledge, cultural knowledge and evidence. Um, so we use this as an umbrella term for DH projects and digital community archives that are doing this work of gathering and maintenance. And these are really networks of people. These are constellations of people and resources and tools that sort of cross institutional boundaries that move between institutions over time um, that are often operating in a sort of volunteer capacity. Okay, so even if they have institutional affiliations, they're still often community-based projects. When we refer to community-centered projects, we're talking about many, many DH projects, maybe most of them, that are sort of grassroots initiative that originate in, that are sort of propelled by and responsive to different kinds of communities. And I'm talking about um, local communities, but also ranging to research communities. Um, so these are, you know, the distinction between these and institutionally based projects has some serious limitations. There's a lot of um, gray area there and a lot of overlap between these kinds of projects. But um, community-based work sort of resists being subsumed by libraries and archives or academic institutions. It's often not, there's often no um, long-term institutional commitment to these projects. Um, sometimes, as in the case of Lakeland Archive, they really resist um, even real affiliation with an institution because the institutions are colonial or predominantly white and they have this fraught historical relationship with the institutions. Um, but sometimes it's just about project creators wanting the project to keep going and to retain control and to have it sort of embedded within their community, um, not to sort of archive it or hand it over to someone else for maintenance. So this visualization depicts the range of sort of teams and groups and communities, organizations, these sort of social collectives that surround and support DH projects, which exist on the spectrum from like the core team that's really doing and actively building the project to these broader communities that are invested in or engaged in the sustainability of the project in some way, even up to the potential allies, the ones who aren't participating or involved in any way, but who are considerations for sustainability because they might become involved down the line. Okay, so communities mean really different things across these contexts. Um, and I should also say they don't, they don't exist in isolation. They also don't really exist in opposition to institutions. Um, and I feel like that, that the dichotomy between communities and institutions can be reductive um, because many DH projects, including community archives, have team members that have some kind of institutional affiliation. Um, that are even maybe supported by an institution. Um, but many are doing this work sort of in the margins of their time, and they're often doing it without adequate credit um, compensation, or they don't get anything in their systems of evaluation and, and promotion um, for this work. So supported by volunteerism in different ways, different shades of it. So the point is not to downplay the importance of institutions to the sustainability of these projects, but to say they're not a cure-all. Um, and we have to be thinking about other factors, and we'll talk more about those. Um, before I go ahead, I should define sustainability. So this is a term you might have heard once or twice. This is a very, um, this concept has gained a lot of attention over the past few years, but it's something we've been talking about in depth for decades within DH. Um, and I love talking about this topic at a DH conference because it's one venue in which I don't have to explain why this is a challenge and why this is also so critically important, how this undermines um, the sustainability, not just of like our digital resources over time, but also um, of, of our work in general, of the whole humanistic enterprise. When our projects aren't sustained, um, they lose validity. Um, and so earlier in this conference, there was a really great talk on sustainability um, by Marika Schumacher and Evelyn I think. Um, they gave such a nice review of the history of this term, um, and, and so I'll, I'll ask you to refer to that. But in its most basic sense, sustainability refers to whether there's an equilibrium within a system um, between the system's inputs and its outputs, whether um, 
whether it can meet the needs of a current generation of users of, of a community without diminishing the possibilities for use down the line or for communities down the line. Um, and so adapting the sort of general definition, we're really just talking about projects remaining viable over time, um, not just whether we can preserve their outputs um, or whether we can fund them, but whether the projects themselves are sort of active, thriving, engaged. Um, and this is really entangled with broader contextual factors, with the institutions and the infrastructures that support scholarship um, and um, with wider economic and sociopolitical environmental concerns. So this slide isn't really meant for you all to read. I didn't want you to have to read through all this text, but it's meant to sort of illustrate um, the density of the conversation so far um, about this topic over the last couple of decades. And despite a couple decades of discourse on this topic, um, I don't know that we've made a lot of headway on the pragmatic realities of actually sustaining projects. So I think that's because this issue is really bound up with these wider um, complexities that we don't have much control over, like how funding is structured, how higher education operates, um, labor considerations, technological change, and so on. But we've been making a lot of conceptual progress, I think. Um, so think about work on project endings, for example, what it means for a project to be done. Um, work on the concept of maintenance, work on the recognition and the valorization of labor on these projects in different roles, um, work on collaborations between libraries and DH that are really equitable um, and not built just on service models, and work on entanglements between um, environmental sustainability, social justice, and other forms of sustainability. And so this, this sort of conceptual landscape is where we're sort of throwing our hat into the ring here. The goal is to add some nuance to our discussion about the roles that communities play in sustainability. So while there's been a lot of really valuable progress, um, most of it has focused on sustaining two kinds of things. We've focused on sustaining technical artifacts and we focused on sustaining organizations. So digital artifacts and infra infrastructures, so thinking about like models of preservation, on shared infrastructure development, and then on sustaining organizations, think about like business models, um, financial considerations, about um, staffing and labor issues. Those are the objects of sustainability that have been the main focus of the DH discourse so far, technical artifacts and organizations of different kinds, different kinds of DH units and teams. Um, but over the past decade or so, um, there's been more research and reflection on the roles of communities um, in DH, and there's been a, some work on how community needs should factor into sustainability planning and community building and maintenance. So I want to point to two super valuable resources in particular. The second from the top here, the Edmund and Marcelli. This is a wonderful um, paper. And then further down, the Langmead um, resources, especially the Socio-Technical Sustainability Roadmap. These are super helpful resources for thinking more holistically about projects, and they've been really helpful to this work. Um, so the project I'm discussing today is building on that work and is trying to um, flesh out what sustainability means to communities of different kinds. So based on my work with Trevor Munoz, my colleague at MIS, um, we're offering this more focused definition of community-centered sustainability. So it's sustained as long as it responsibly supports the endurance of the communities that it serves um, as a locus of memory, communication, and knowledge production for as long as useful and in whatever forms are useful. So the things to notice here, um, that sustainability may have an end date, um, that it entails projects fundamentally changing sometimes, transforming in what they're trying to do and what shape they take, um, and that the goal is to serve communities first rather than making sort of persistence of the project or its resources in a vacuum the main goal of sustainability work. So the main takeaway is sustainability is clearly really context dependent. It means different things to different projects. And so the research question we had before us was, what does it mean to the four case studies that we have? Um, and what factors do they take into account when they are going about sustainability planning? Um, so based on our research, we've come up with this framework of six factors that are sort of common across these projects, six considerations in community-centered sustainability. Um, and most of these will be really intuitive to you, I think, um, but we hope that the framework as a whole will help you think a little more holistically about sustainability. 
So we can't really offer solutions here because, again, this is very context dependent, but we've found these factors to come up again and again across all four of those very diver divergent projects in terms of how they think about what it means to endure. So I want to walk through these really briefly. I'm just going to dwell on the first um, three, really, and sort of skip through the final three just for the sake of time. And I'll give some examples from the projects to illustrate, but all these examples, um, you know, case studies are most interesting when you really get to dive in and, and get some deep um, detail and insight. That's hard to do in a spoken presentation, so I'll refer you to the white paper that this is based on. I have a link at the end where you can read more about the examples and what makes them interesting and distinctive. So the first factor pertains to how community-based projects first identify their communities, um, their relevant communities beyond just the team, beyond the user group, um, but other invested communities, and how they get specific about them and then how they strategically engage them. Okay, so all the projects did this in really different ways, but they all did it. Um, so as we worked with each project, we modeled how they talked about their, their groups and the communities that are stakeholders in their work and what they looked like. I won't dwell here, and I'm only showing two examples, one from the Lakeland Digital Archive, the other from the Enslaved.org project. But each project has been careful about identifying and making explicit the existence of this range of communities, um, these sort of like widening pools of collaborators or potential collaborators, ranging from that core team at the heart of it to um, surrounding teams, um, nearby communities, and then at the outermost edges, these like wider disciplines, broader publics that aren't currently involved, but that might be down the line. And they think consciously about um, not just identifying the groups, but on strategies for how to draw members from the sort of outer strata closer into, um, closer into the middle. Um, so they understand that people move back and forth over the course of the project between these sorts of levels, um, and they think about what does it mean to take our users and involve them more actively in contributing to the project or as partners in the project? What does it mean to turn these like wider groups of potentially invested people into active users? How do we do that? And they build outreach strategies around um, this sort of stratified model. The second factor pertains to how each project sort of factors in or actively thinks about the well-being of the communities that they're serving. Um, so this was one of the most striking outcomes of the study when we asked our projects about sustainability for their project. They didn't usually start by talking about the data um, or the infrastructure or the funding. Um, they usually talked about the people. Um, and they talked about the real impact on people's lived experiences, not just of the project and its outcomes, but of the process of doing the work. So in every case study, we found that when we asked them to define what sustainability means for them, their answer revolved around how well their project supports the teams or the communities affected by it. Um, so they think about sustainability as being something mutual between the people and the project. Um, so for the Lakeland Digital Archive, this is really manifested in that restorative justice initiative that I mentioned, um, how the process of building the archive collaboratively um, and building momentum around it became the sort of foundation for activism and active reparations um, for the community and, and also just improved social cohesion in this community despite the fact that it's experiencing um, diaspora. And for the Open ITI project, on the other hand, which is a fundamentally different kind of thing, fundamentally different set of communities, um, there the team members were really defining sustainability around um, the outcomes for their most vulnerable team members. So they were thinking about the fact that for a project to be sustainable, it needs to have sort of multi-generational investment. So they were really focused on ensuring adequate credit and visibility for the graduate students, postdocs, and figuring out how they could land so that they could remain invested in their collaborative work over time um, so that the project can have this sort of long-term investment from its members. Closely related to that, that second factor is the third, which is how each project makes their values explicit and then how they manifest those values in the design and structure and organization of the project. So in practice, this takes a lot of forms. The most um, obvious examples are projects explicitly documenting their community values um, through things like 
ethics statements or codes of conduct or guidelines, guidelines on community norms. So this is the Enslaved Outward Projects um, statement of ethics that has sort of served as a touchstone for their project. And our other projects also had explicit statements of their values. Um, and beyond these efforts to make their values explicit and to document them and make them publicly accessible, um, they then also really found concrete ways to realize those values in their practices and how they organize their projects. So the Enslaved.org project, for example, with the statement of ethics, it was, it was sort of a touchstone for them as they were designing new workflows for bringing community data into the project, for example. Um, they would return to it and reread it um, as they thought about ways to increase community consistency consideration and involvement in the project. Um, the MEI community works to make sure its governance structures are remaining democratic, and then it also offers this growing set of training and instructional resources that are meant to increase inclusion for the community, accessibility, and openness. Um, and they think about those things as directly contributing to project sustainability. Obviously, you need an invested community to survive. The Lakeland community, um, it's interesting in their case, they've made all their technical design choices to facilitate the ultimate handoff of the project from MIF, where it's currently hosted, back to the community. Um, so that includes things like, I mean, the community is involved in every technical um, development decision, but um, it's about building capacity within the community for managing the archive as a website, but it's also about um, creating copies and versions of the archive that are distributable so that they can hand them back to the community, for example, on thumb drives. So they've been handing out um, copies on thumb drives so that the community can really actually physically own their collection. And I won't dwell on these last few because I'm getting close to the end here, but um, it also, the other factors have to do with how, and I've just sort of touched on this with the Lakeland example, but how these different projects think about community ownership and control and what it means to retain that over time, um, how community-based projects understand their sort of surrounding ecosystems of resources. That one's not surprising. Um, but my favorite, in some ways, is this last. It's about how communities think about how their projects need to change. Um, coming from library and information science, the goal of sustainability work is often actually preservation, which means sometimes putting things into amber, you know, making sure they stay the same over time, um, checking bits to make sure nothing has altered. Um, but in community-based sustainability work, it's really more about adaptation, resilience, um, and change and evolution over time. So before I wrap up, I want to just acknowledge that I'm part of a larger team here that, um, of people who aren't here today with me. Alia, Jessica, Courtney are all students I've been working with. Travis Wagner is a colleague of mine at the University of Maryland. And our case study partners have been so generous with us. I mean, they've really been um, amazing with their time. And this project has also gotten some funding from the Mellon Foundation and from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. We're really grateful for that. Um, and coming up next, I have a QR code here so you can um, learn more about the project. There's some links to the white paper I mentioned and the pub other publications from the project. Um, but we're about to start a set of interviews with people on the institutional side now. So we've been looking at these case studies of DH projects, and now we're going to be talking to libraries and archives. Um, and if this sounds like you, I would love to hear from you. I'd love to be able to have a chance to talk to you about how you are engaging with communities and sustaining them. Um, and then we'll build out a set of resources to support this work. I'll also mention that I'm part of the research team for the ACLS Commission on Fostering and Sustaining um, Diverse Digital Scholarship. Um, this, is a, this is a large commission of senior scholars. I'm on the research team supporting the commission's work, but they are producing recommendations that should be out in the next year or so um, for sustaining digital scholarship and a more diversified and inclusive ecosystem of scholarship in the humanities. Okay. I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much.